Thank you, everyone, and welcome again to another one of our fabulous National Family History Month events. Uh, just uh, asking if you could all switch your phones on to silent, please, if you haven't already done so. And also a hello and a welcome to our listeners who, or maybe watchers, who are attending via our webinar today. Um, so before we begin our talk with Kate Verme for her discussion on Mrs. Allport as the greatest flirt in the colony, um, we would like to acknowledge Tasmania's Aboriginal peoples. We recognise the deep histories and cultures of the Aboriginal people of Lutruwita, Tasmania. We acknowledge Tasmanian Aboriginal people as the traditional and continuing custodians of the land, waters and sky. We pay respect to the elders past and present who hold the memories, traditions, culture and knowledge of country. We extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples whose countries were never ceded. So, as I mentioned, our speaker today is Kate Verme. You may already be familiar um, with her past talks here in the Allport Library and Museum. Um, she's a great colleague with a bountiful amount of knowledge about the Allport family. Um, Kate has a BA in history, and today's presentation is part two of Kate's series on Anne Floyd Chapman, who is the mother of Mary Morton Allport. Part one, uh, which was called the Jane Austen-esque diaries of Mary Morton Allport's mother, can be found on the library's Tasmania SoundCloud and YouTube pages with many of our other past National Family History Month talks. Uh, when we left off, Anne Floyd Chapman was lamenting her lot in life and those of her children, in particular two of her sons, Tom and James, and also that of her daughter, Mary Morton Allport, who was far away in Van Diemen's land. In today's talk, we will catch up with Anne Floyd as she records the joys, heartbreak, losses, and new beginnings faced by her family here. Anne Floyd's journal contain a remarkable account of an everyday family living in early Victorian England. So please welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming Kate. Hello, everybody. Um, before I start, I am going to make an apology for my voice. I've had a bit of a head cold and now I've got some asthma, so I do apologise if my voice kind of disappears and I have to cough. So just wanted to mention that at the start. I also wanted to say a big thank you to my colleagues, Chloe and Amberley, who helped me with my beautiful PowerPoint, because without them, it would have been incredibly boring. And you would have had a family history, a family um, tree that was, well, shall we say, not the greatest. Um, so thank you for that. So when I first started planning this talk, I did think that I would have plenty of time to cover the second part of Anne Floyd Chapman's journals. Alas, that was not to be, as it became clear that there was no way I was going to be able to cover everything of interest unless we were all prepared to sit here for another hour or so, which I'm assuming we're not, although my boss did give me the opportunity to extend it for half an hour, but I said um, so in the end, I've had to make the decision to focus on certain people and events during a specific time period, that of September 1835 through to May 1837. So rather than give you a complete wrap up of Anne Floyd's life as recorded in her journals and that of her general circle, um, there was a lot going on in the counties of Warwickshire and Staffordshire between 1834 and 1839, from riots to balls to pomp and ceremony of the Stafford Cavalry being presented with their colours. Anne Floyd faithfully recorded it all for her absent daughter. Throw in the chaotic Chapmans themselves, and I have no doubt that Mary Morton and her family felt like they were receiving a serialised drama every time they received a box from England containing one of Anne Floyd's journals. So without further ado, let's get started. Thought I'd start with a super quick recap, although Jazz just gave us one, but I'll give you another one. For those who missed the first part or those who have simply forgotten who is who in the zoo, so to speak. 
1831, after a falling out with his older brother, Henry Curzon Allport, over the family's business affairs, Joseph Allport packed up his family, Mary Morton, Nee Chapman, their young son, Morton, and three business partners, including Mary Morton's brother, James Evett Chapman, his wife, Eliza, their young daughter, Annie, and a Mr. William Ward. So Mr. William Ward was an in-law of Joseph Orport's brother, John Orport. So John Orport's wife was a ward as well. And they all set off for a new beginning in Van Diemen's Land. Accompanying them on their voyage was a Mr. Alfred Betts and a Mr. Charles Sherratt. So there we go. That's the um, arrival notice. It tells you when they arrived. There they all are listed. And there. So leaving behind all they knew and loved, they arrived with essentially nothing but the dream of making a successful new life in the colonies. Unfortunately, this did not go to plan and they soon re and he soon realised that he was not cut out to be a farmer. Joseph Allport dissolved the partnership less than 12 months in. So there you go, that's him dissolving it. And he moved his wife and family to Hobart Town where he returned to the practice of law. Of this change in circumstances, Mary Morton Allport writes in her own journal on the 23rd of September, 1832, Joseph has been offered a partnership in the most respectable office in Hobart Town, which I hope he will be able to accept. On the 28th of September, 1832, she writes, James came from Hobart with a packet of letters from England, two from dear mother, one from her sister Louisa, and Joseph has more than me from Mary Ann. So Mary Ann Allport was Joseph's sister. And Joseph also writes to tell me that he has settled with Mr Cartwright quite to his satisfaction and he will engage our lodgings today. And so began the Allport's life in Hobart Town, Van Diemen's Land. Meanwhile, James Everett Chapman and William Ward forged ahead with their fledgling businesses as storekeepers. And I can't say this word, so we're just going to say it's someone who's licensed to sell alcohol and provisions in the Blackbrush Broadmarsh area. It's particular, but you know that word, particular. Okay. Thank you. I knew you'd know how to say it. <laughs> <laughs> James and Mr Ward went to town for their licence and they are going to take it out on the house, um, Mary Morton wrote on the 16th of September, 1832. While all this was happening in Van Diemen's Land, half a world away in Birmingham, England, we have their mother, Anne Floyd Chapman, who with her husband, William Chapman, or Mr C, runs her late father's hotel, the Castle Inn in High Street in Birmingham. So there's our little picture of the Castle Inn, and you can see um, it just at the top there, it just says Chapman in that little semicircle above the door there. Yep. It is here we find her writing the daily accounts of her life in her journals to send to Mary. The journals which survive in the Allport collection are incomplete and were written between May 1834 and June 1839. We do know, however, through Mary's own writing, that she received a journal prior to May 1834. On June 4, 1833, she writes, received a box from my mother with frocks for Morton and Anne, a journal and some letters. This suggests perhaps that Anne Floyd started writing her journals to Mary from the moment the Allports and Co. set sail for Van Diemen's Land, but have since, they have since been lost to time. We will never know, of course. Still, I don't imagine Anne Floyd randomly started writing her accounts approximately two years after the Allports' departure, unless, of course, this was when she realised that they were never coming home. In the first part of this series, I covered Anne Floyd's writings from May 1834 to mid-1835 and helped to establish our main player, Anne Floyd Chapman, and her cast of supporting characters. Ta-da! There we go. There they are. Um, I, and I did accidentally miss off one of Louise's children, so she's in there. She does have another one in there. That I've chopped out. Um, so namely her husband, Mr C or William Chapman, her children Fanny, Mrs Henry Edwards, Thomas Chapman, Mary Morton, Mrs Joseph Allport, James Evett Chapman, ship captain Humphrey Evett Chapman, William Floyd Chapman and Louisa, Mrs Charles Mucklow. Their spouses, Henry Edwards, Mary Ann Prentice, Joseph Allport, Eliza Hart, Emma Greatwood and Charles Mucklow. Her many grandchildren, who I'm not going to name, her sister, Mrs Mary Partridge, her brother-in-law, local surgeon, Mr Samuel Partridge, her brother, surgeon, apothecary, and landlord of the Castle Hotel, where the Chapmans live, Mr James Evett, 
her sister-in-law, Miss Mary Morton Chapman, and longtime Chapman family nurse, Sarah Godso, as well as the Allports, Mr. William, Mrs. Hannah, and their daughter, Miss Mary Ann Allport. So there you go, so just because they're all named the same. Um, <laughs> So there's Humphrey Emmett at the top. So that was Anne Floyd's father. He married Anne Floyd. She then became Anne Floyd Emmett, who then became Anne Floyd Chapman. And as you can see, the names, the names carry on through there. So the journal provides us with a remarkable and rare insight into the daily lives of an ordinary family living in Birmingham, England in the late Georgian, early Victorian period. The pages are filled with stories of Mary Morton Allport's siblings, their acquaintances, visitors, and all manner of social mountings and gossips. Miss Anne Floyd tells of illnesses suffered, weddings enjoyed, great joys, and even greater losses, as well as a mother's love, pain, disappointment, and despair at seeing her children struggle. When we last left Anne Floyd Chapman in September 1835, she was lamenting the lives of her children, in particular that of her two sons, Thomas Chapman and James Everett Chapman, from here on known as Thomas and James. Now, for those of you who came or who listened to my first talk on Anne Floyd's journals, first of all, thank you very much. And hopefully you'll remember that Anne Floyd's eldest son, Thomas Chapman, had inherited his grandfather, Anne Floyd's father, Hen Humphrey Evatt, so there he is at the top there, um, share of his coach proprietor's stock in 1833. This, however, did not turn out to be the blessing it may first have seemed, as Thomas, you see, has got to be the, unlike, the most unluckiest coach proprietor in all of Birmingham if not the whole of Warwickshire, because of the between his many, and I do mean many, accidents, loss of horses, and the emerging railways, his business is suffering and Thomas is running headlong into bankruptcy, dragging his mother with him. Oh, and that's just the Chapman side of the family. So you can see where the name Morton's come from. So William Chapman's father was Thomas Chapman. His mother was Anne Morton. So again, the family name continues. The horse we had from Cottrell, which cost 30 pounds, was killed yesterday. Trouble seemed to accumulate on my shoulders. His mother writes in November 1835, after the death of yet another horse. If time allows, we will return to Thomas later and see how it all turns out for him and his long-suffering mother. For now, though, we will shift to James Ebert Chapman, who is not faring so well in Van Diemen's land. With his partnership with Joseph Orport dissolved and the departure of his last remaining partner, William Ward, who returned to England, James Chapman was in a bit of a hole. His business was not doing well and his debts were mounting. And by mid-1834, advertisements were being placed in the local Van Diemen's Land newspapers, advising that Mr Alfred Betts and Mr C. Sherratt had purchased the business and would be responsible for paying for all debts due for the late firm of Ward and Chapman. Now, as we know from the first half of Anne Floyd's journals, where she gave us a running commentary of the dramas unfolding in Van Diemen's Land, Alfred Betts was named as the villain of that particular story and the architect of her son James's downfall, whereby instead of helping to pull James out of trouble, the selling of his business to Betts only enhanced James's difficulties. For if Anne Floyd's counsel to be believed, Betts did not honour his promise to pay off the debts of Chapman and Ward, leaving James essentially ruined, owing money to creditors in Van Diemen's Land and England, including to members of his own family. But James, for his sins, was not one to quit, and 1834 also sees him try his hand at yet another partnership, this time with a Mr W Hobbs, advertising themselves as Chapman and Hobbs auctioneers and general commission agents in the Bothell Hamilton area of Van Diemen's Land. This partnership, however, was to follow the same path as his previous ones and was dissolved in April 1835. And by June of that year, James and his family were preparing to travel back home to England via the Dorothy. So they sailed on the 11th of June, 1835 for Liverpool. On the 15th of October, 1835, Anne Floyd writes that she has received a letter from her daughter, Mary, which much surprised us with the intelligence James is coming home in the Dorothy. Two days later, on the 17th of October, Anne Floyd is visiting the Allport family in Aldridge, where she learns that they too have received a letter from their son, Joseph, a letter which also carries the news that James is returning home from Van Diemen's land. She writes, They have a letter from Joseph, speaking of James and his family coming home. Oh, that he had never gone, 
but God's will be done. I only hope his head is not deranged as they, Mary and Joseph, represent. My Mary little thinks of the grief I have sustained. May her children never cause her to suffer as I have done. So for all we have done for James, he is coming home worse than a beggar. But Mrs Allport bids me to wish to tell Mary that she loves her very dearly. While waiting for the return of her son, James and his family, Anne Floyd continues to write in her journals, regaling Mary with tales of everyday events in her life. She writes that she took a house for James on Leamington Terrace, noted her husband, Mr C, was in ill health, describes how she had tea with her daughters, Mrs Fanny Edwards and Mrs Louisa Mucklow, went to dinner with friends, attended the theatre, visited her sister Mary Partridge, um, also known as Aunt P, where she would often indulge in a game of quadrille. So it was a card game and apparently it was incredibly complicated. So they later um, chopped it down and it became a game known as Whist, which any of you have watched Bridgerton or read any of the novels know they play quite a lot. It's a bit of a gambling game. But through it all, she constantly worries about James on his journey home. Where is poor James? I fear I shall not hear. I fear I shall hear of some accident. The wind roars so fearfully, and who could blame her? Such a journey was fraught with danger. And to be fair to Anne Floyd, her children's lives have not exactly been disaster-free of late. In preparation for James's return, Anne Floyd and Co. have been busy cleaning, repairing, and finished furnishing the house on the terrace and at great expense to herself. May James be worthy of all the trouble and pain he has cost me. I can only pray and hope, she writes. Given the many difficulties James has had with his business and the great debts he has incurred while in Van Diemen's land, one could hardly blame Anne Floyd for these thoughts. On the 9th of November, 1835, Anne Floyd receives word that James and his family have arrived safely in Liverpool. The arrival of James, Eliza, and their two children, Annie, five, and Jimmy, or Jimmy, three, three days later in Birmingham, should have been cause for much celebration for Anne Floyd. However, that does not appear to be the case, as upon first seeing them, she writes, poor James, Eliza and their children have arrived here in ragged ire and very ill. My heart bleeds for them. The next day, it's a wet morning. God's always returned. God's always not returned. She went home with James and his family last night to take care of them. Poor Eliza is too weak to walk. She has been very ill or voyage. Went up to see poor James and his family, though very unwell myself. The dear children are well. All Eliza's sisters and cousins have called upon her. She is very ill and it grieves me much. Poor James dined here. He coughs very sadly. So ill are James and Eliza that their children are sent to be cared for by their uncle and aunt Tom and Marion Chapman in neighbouring Greet their aunt Fanny Edwards and by Anne Floyd herself, a circumstance which continued throughout much of their lives. And I ask you to stop and think for a moment what that must have been like for these children. So they've been removed from the only home and the family that they have known. They have been confined to a ship for months, arrived in a place that was so big, so foreign and so busy and thrust into the care of people for whom they have no memory or connection. With their parents both so ill, they must have been very scared. On November 19, 1835, she writes, Mr Partridge, so Mr Partridge was um, Anne Floyd's brother-in-law and also the local doctor, thinks Eliza is in a very dangerous state. I have been putting leeches on her chest. I am very sorry for her. She cannot move without assistance and James's cough is terrible. They're pretty jar, isn't it? Think of, think of what's in it. <laughs> False sense of security. If you saw that coming at you, you'd be like, oh, that's nice. Oh, no, not so great. Okay, okay, it's me. Um, as we pass through November and into December of 1835, James recovers while Eliza continues to languish and she remains the focus of much of Anne Floyd's care and attention. So November 25, 1835, Louisa has no use of her limbs and continues very ill. Mr Partridge fears Eliza has an affliction of the spine and it grieves me very much. On the 5th of December, 1835, Eliza continues very ill. Mr Partridge and Mr Bartlett, another doctor, called to see her today. I am very low-spirited. December 16, 1835, Mr Partridge thinks there is an enlargement on Eliza's spine and she still has no use of her limbs. On October 19, 1835, Mr Partridge called to tell me that there is a curvature in Eliza's back which has caused the bone to press on the spinal marrow and produce paralysis and wasting of the limbs. 
On December 20, 1835, she's had a blister put on her back, poor suffering creature. Um, so for those of you that don't know, blisters were often used during the Georgian era to help with any medical issues. So to raise a blister, it was used out of cantharides, which is from um, a beetle, so known as the blister beetle, or also sometimes known as the Spanish fly. It was often mixed together with other ingredients to make a plaster, which they then applied to the patient's skin. Once the blister was raised, it was then opened and covered with a healing ointment and a rag. Other ways they used to achieve the blister was to use a piece of polished iron, which they then heated in boiling water and applied it directly to the skin. Um, as with leeches, blisters were thought to relieve the pressure and purge the body of bad humours, therefore hopefully restoring the patient to good health. By Christmas 1835, Anne Floyd has another family illness on her hands. On December 25th, 1835, Louisa is very unwell, spent the afternoon in applying leeches to her chest. Eliza, James and children to dinner, though so poorly, and Thomas and his wife. A very flat day for me. You were pleased to know that Louisa does make a recovery the next day, all thanks, no doubt, to the leeches applied by her mother. December 26th, 1835, Louisa is better. The leeches have returned her. This was not the case with Eliza, however. I called to see Eliza. She is going to have another blister, she writes on the 29th of December, 1835. With Eliza so unwell and James looking for work, the new year once again sees Anne Floyd take charge of her grandchildren and the domestic drama being played out at her son and daughter-in-law's house at Leamington Terrace. January the 1st, 1836, the years, the years begins not brightly for me in many respects. I took Annie to stop a week. Poor Eliza, no better. I am plagued with that house and that servant. She is a lying, artful girl, and Eliza, being unable to move, is left to herself. James is very poorly. He goes to a situation next week. What pressure is on my shoulders? So here we have the formidable yet understandably exhausted Anne Floyd trying to run her business, the Castle Hotel, which itself is plagued with problems and low occupancy numbers, along with caring for her ailing husband, missing her absent daughter, dealing with her recently returned destitute son and his very poorly wife, picking up the pieces for her grandchildren, and not to mention attempting to cope with all the drama surrounding her other children, plus her concern for her extended family members and friends, who themselves are not without hardship. January the 11th, 1836, a deep snow. God so has gone up to the terrace, wrote to Mary. Humphrey, her son, took the letter to London the next day. We lost three greatcoats out of the traveller's room. Two days later, the letter was returned to me that Humphrey took to London because he admitted pain. So now I have to write to Mary again. And we thought the mothers in Jane Austen's novels had it tough. There is, however, cause for celebration in the Chapman family with the upcoming birthday festivities for Anne Floyd's youngest sons, Humphrey and William, and the planning of William's wedding to Emma Greathood, which is to take place that April, and the joy of seeing her grandchildren adapt and grow in their new home. January the 15th, 1836, little Willie, so little Willie Edwards, one of her grandchildren, was quite taken with his cousin Annie. He calls her a pretty witcher. She actually does write witcher. Um, <laughs> With birthdays celebrated, Anne Floyd's worries are momentarily forgotten. 22nd of January, 1836. William's birthday. Gave a dance and entertainment to 75 persons. All enjoyed themselves very much and declared it was a sumptuous entertainment. They broke up at half past seven in the morning. It was to, it was to commemorate, too much playing quadrille. I mean, it was to commemorate Humphrey being of age as well. In the centre of the supper table, we have had a beautiful ship, the Humphrey and William. It was in full sail, made of spun barley sugar and sails were made of wafer paper. It was made at Mr. Greatwood. So Mr. Greatwood was Emma Greatwood's father and he was a confectioner. And it was made as a present for William and Humphrey. 23rd of January, my head is very bad. I lay down a bit at six o'clock and up at 10, better than I expected after the fatigue. 26th of January, 1836. Gave our servants an entertainment last night to commemorate Humphrey and William being of age. Another bright spot for Anne Floyd is when she received some very welcome news from her sister-in-law, Mary Morton Chapman, on the 8th of February, 1837. 
I got this letter from Miss Chapman to tell me she had had a letter from Mary with a miniature of her as Norma, of which she is very proud. She has hung it over the chimney piece. Now, I believe the reference to Norma is possibly from the 1831 opera Norma by Vincenzo Bellini and Felice Romani, which was based on the Alexander Sume play. And Mary Morton Allport did like painting herself as romantic characters. So there she is looking beautiful. Violet's in her hair. There's another one of her as Ophelia. A bit, bit windswept. One would think she was on the moors. New Yorkshire in that one. And that's just a cute one because I like it too with her kids. So she's got Morton, Mary Louise or Minnie and Curzon. He wouldn't think he'd grow up to be who he turned out to be, would you? <laughs> Look at that. There he is. Um, Anne Floyd's joy at seeing Mary's likeness is somewhat tempered when word reaches her that a Mr Edwards, not to be confused with her son-in-law Henry Edwards, from Hobart Town, was said to have been describing Mary as follows. Mr Edwards, who has married Miss Sharp, oh yeah, that's another one, um, <laughs> Mr Edwards, who has married Miss Sharp, said at Coventry that Mary was the belle of the place, being Hobart Town, but a great flirt, and he should take care his wife did not keep her company. He is a very great puppy by James's account. On March the 9th, 1836, Anne Floyd writes, I have sent Mary word that Mr. That, that Mr. Edwards, who married Miss Sharp, said of her, I repeat his words, Mrs. Allport was the greatest flirt in the colony, and he should take care that his wife should not associate with her. This slight on her daughter is still playing on Anne Floyd's mind some six or so months later when she writes in October the 8th, 1836. Miss A, Mary Ann Allport, sent letters by young Sharp to Mary. Mrs Sharp remarked to Miss A that Mrs Allport, Mary, was very gay. This must come from her son-in-law, that Edwards. I hope Mary shall resent the character he gave her. And of course you, Mary, will cut him in Hobart Town as he has said, he should take care that his wife have no acquaintance with you, your old schoolfellow, Miss Sharp of Coventry. Miss Orport was in the company of Mrs Sharp and her son in Leamington, and she thought Mrs Sharp's remarks very odd. In November of that year, she writes with great satisfaction that Miss Orport has confirmed that Mr Edwards's character was, held not in, was not held in great esteem in Hobart Town and that someone might like to inform Mrs Sharp of the estimation of her son-in-law as he is held in Hobart Town as a scamp. Okay. We will now return to happier moments in the lives of the Chapman, this one being the joyous occasion of William and Emma's wedding day on the 12th of April, 1836. At five o'clock, 30 of us sat down, all very happy and comfortable, and with a fine day. Fanny and Henry dined with us and all our family, except Mr and Mrs P and Miss Chapman, who never joins large parties. We dined at Mr Greatwood's, keeping up the wedding, and danced all night. Mr Chapman dances better than any of the young folk. Later that week, Anne Floyd attends a guest at the Castle Inn who is going to early labour. A most unexpected event leading to her making new friends and acquaintances, friends who would prove to be an excellent connection for her daughter Mary and son-in-law Joseph. Mm. Mrs Randall is put to bed here at the Castle Inn at five o'clock this morning. She has had a daughter and is going on well. Her nurse was with her. Mrs Randall's baby is so small they have waited. It is three pounds, two ounces and 16 inches at length. It is a seven-month child. A month later, she writes, Mrs Randall and her family leave us tomorrow. The dear babe is a little better. I went to see her this evening and she, when she told me, to my surprise, Miss Palmer had told her that I had a daughter in Van Diemen's land and she wrote your name down. Her uncle, Sir John Franklin, <laughs> is going out to be governor there and I trust my kindness to her may gain Joseph and Mary a friend. You, Mary, have no occasion to be ashamed of your origin, though we are publicans. In true Victorian style, worries soon return to Anne Floyd's door in the form of more illness and injury, which are once again plaguing the family. April 19, 1836, Mr Chapman has got pushed down the stairs at a church meeting and is very poorly indeed. Get rowdy at church over there. <laughs> 
April 21st, 1836, Mr Chapman so poorly could not come home. He's been in grief with his son, Tom. Um, I fear this fall has seriously hurt him. April 26th, 22nd, sorry, 1836, went to greet to see Mr Chapman. I stopped all night. Mr Chapman very ill there. Upon returning home on April 24th, 1836, she discovers my poor James is very ill. He has injured himself coughing. Nothing but troubles in life in one shape or another. On May the 1st, 1836, I must see James and Eliza. She is very ill. James is very poorly and he has gone to the warehouse for the first time since Wednesday. On May the 12th, 1836, we begin to see the shadow of despair creep slowly towards Anne Floyd and she writes, it's very hot, Mr Chapman very poorly in bed all day. But it is not all doom and gloom for Anne Floyd and on the 17th of May, she celebrates Mary Moore Northall's birthday. My dear Mary's birthday, we had plum pudding, loin of veal for dinner and drank to her health, wishing them prosperity. On 28th of May, 1836, we learn that her daughter Louisa Mucklow is expecting her first child. However, as we have come to expect from this family, the joy of this news is lessened somewhat by the increasing worry of her husband's illness. Mr Chapman very poorly indeed and looking so pale, it makes me quite low. Louisa came to stay here till after her confinement. Mr Chapman is anxious to have her here. He loves her company and is much pleased. On June the 8th, 1836, Anne Floyd records that her husband's cough has increased. And two days later, on June the 10th, 1836, Louisa gives birth to her son, Charles William Mucklow. Louisa very poorly all day. At 10 minutes past 11 at night, she was put to bed of a son, a very fine boy. Her fortitude surpasses everything I have ever met with. She never said, oh, but bore all with great patience. Mr Partridge says he has never met anyone who was so patient. And the next day, Louisa and her babe are comfortable. Lots of inquiries after her. She is much beloved by everyone. Mr C has gone to Small Heath, so Small Heath is another little township near the, where they are in Birmingham, to tell all there of Louisa's accoutrement, though she is very poorly, and I've probably said that word wrong too, and I apologise. On June the 12th, 1836, Mr C went to Art Partridge's to supper, and he had such a coughing fit that it alarmed Mrs. Mrs P and Mr P, and they wanted him to stay all night, but I called for him. On June the 14th, 1836, Mr Chapman's breath is so bad and heat so oppressive. Thomas has persuaded him to go to greet and he is very ill, yet patiently moves around first to one place and then to another. He went to sit with Eliza, he went to sit with Louisa there in room 15 and the exertion was too much. He said in his joking way, oh love, I have lost my puff and I cannot stay in this room. Our car man, Metcalf, very saucy and gone away. They nearly drive me mad in the yard. And Mr Chapman can only look at me piteously without speaking his mind. He seems to have no energy. On June the 15th, 1836, Thomas tells me his father is very poorly indeed. And we are all so, and we are so full of coach proprietors that I cannot go to see him. Mr Roberts came from London. He tells me Mr and Mrs Orport are very well. On June 16th, 1836, Mr Chapman very ill. I went to greet to see him. His cough is dreadful. I shall take Mr Partridge and fetch him home tomorrow. But this was not to be. As we learn the next day, my dear husband departed this life at half past four this morning. My grief I cannot describe. Words cannot express it. His fortitude, his patience, all his love for me breaks upon me till my head is chaos. Anne Floyd does not write in her journal again until the 22nd of June, 1836, the day of her beloved husband's funeral, brokenheartedly recording the day for Mary. My beloved husband was consigned to his last home at St Paul's with his six children to this day, so they had lost six children. Um, my poor Thomas is very ill, never has been himself since he lost his father. Mr Greatwood... Mr. Manchin, Mr. Edwards, Mr. Mucklow, Mr. Hayden and Mr. James Brown were his pallbearers. Being in a lead coffin, he was very heavy. Mr. Partridge and clergymen followed. Thomas, though very ill, James and William went as mourners. I fear for Tom. Miss Chapman, Mrs. Partridge, Mrs. Edwards came to see me and in every respect we could were shown to his remains. 
Louisa decorated his coffin with flowers and dear Fanny brought some beautiful geraniums which William threw into his grave and they fell near to his heart where he generally in life was adorned with a flower. I trust he is happy in the realms of bliss or his dear children are overwhelmed with grief. They have dined with me today, but poor Charles and Marion was obliged to be taken home and Mr Partridge thinks Tom is alarmingly ill. He has had 18 leeches placed behind his ears. You do love the leeches. My dear Mary is so far away and little thinks of our troubles unless by some sympathetic feeling spread over her, because of course she's got no idea that this is happening. My dear father, my dear sister left me at eight o'clock at night and she has been with me every day and Fanny and I am grateful for the kindness of dear Fanny. Henry's affection is deeply engraved in my heart. In short, all my children's kindness has been very great. Poor Humphrey could not come. He has written most affectionately and feeling with deep sorrow to my sister and requests a newspaper as it still seems like a dream to him. I shall write to him by next vessel. I trust I shall be able to by then. Poor Godso's grief is extreme, is extreme and everyone deeply feels his loss so unexpectedly called away and so kind to everyone but himself. He increased the cough he had upon him by going to the Coventry Fair and Mr P thinks he had water on his chest. Poor Louisa is much affected. She has lost her best friend, she says. My nose bleeds violently and has done ever since Mr Chapman's death. Every fresh face brings it on, but Mr P thinks it eases my head. On the 23rd of June, 1836, I have passed a bad night and I am very weak this morning, but I must endeavour to rouse myself. My dear children are all very kind. I have received an affectionate note from my sister and Mrs Davies and it pours a little balm on my wounded heart. My dear Thomas is very ill, but Marion is come to stop at the bar being a Thursday for a few hours, for I am unable to leave my room. So remember, she's still trying to run a business. She thinks him a little easier. He feels his father's loss more than many one in many causes. All at small Heath regret Mr Chapman's death and it is thrown quite a shade over that place. 25th of June, 1836. I have been dreaming of my dear husband. I have had a wretched night. I am up regularly 10 or half past 10 minutes or half past four o'clock, the hour he died. And I walk about. It leaves me low and weak in the morning. I believe her writing to Mary in such heartbreaking detail is a way of ensuring that Mary is included in the mourning process, that although she is half a world away, she's still very much a part of their family and shares in the grief that they all feel at the loss of the beloved Mr C. It may also be a cathartic process for Anne Floyd, allowing her to express her grief and loss in words. Anne Floyd sends copies of the newspaper carrying the news of Mr Chapman's death to Joseph Warport in Van Diemen's Land and also to her son, Captain Humphrey Chapman, who is away at sea. She reports that she has received a letter from old Mrs Allport, who had not yet heard of my loss until Mrs Jackson took her a newspaper. The dear lady writes very affectionately. And the next day, Mrs Allport calls on with Anne Floyd. She was shocked at my dear husband's death. On the 5th of July, 1836, she writes, I cannot get better of the loss of my dear husband, nor do I try to describe my feelings. I can only think of the love he bore me. Now that Louisa has gone home, there is a double vacuum at the castle. On July 6, 1836, Mrs Greatwood, so Emma, her daughter-in-law's mother, went to me to Thomas's house in Greet, and I was nearly broken-hearted when I sat on the sofa where I had parted with my dear husband. Oh, what pangs strike at me. I little thought when we, when we, he last kissed me that it would be for the last time or I would never have left him. On July the 9th, 1836, I got a letter from dear Mary. She little thinks her father is no more. How did he love her and Louisa more than any of his other children? How pleased he would have been to have seen her letter. I went to see Miss Chapman. It was a melancholy visit. I cannot rec rec reconcile myself to my loss and I am very ill. I fear if I do not rouse myself, I shall soon follow my husband. But the ability to wallow in her grief and mourn her dear husband is a luxury Anne Floyd is not afforded. As summer draws to an end, her son James comes to her with news that will further add to Anne Floyd's already overburdened cup. On August the 2nd, 1836, poor James came to see me about his drunken wife as if I have had not grief and trouble enough, I grieve for all he has endured. The following day, August the 3rd, she writes, 
I am going to talk to James's wife on her conduct. I have seen she is a confirmed drunkard. Poor James has come in. He says his father's spirit hovered over him last night. He slept in room five where his father's body had lain and it whispered to him, as you are strong, be merciful. He says he will forgive her. How extraordinary of his dreaming of his father. He was wishing he was here to advise him on how to act. And my heart bleeds for him. She was drunk all the voyage home. And I recall in Mr. Allport's letter, he names James accusing his wife of such practices. And he thought his mind had wandered. It is true. I have seen it. And, not, and, and I will not need to enter into particulars, but I hope she will amend. On the 5th of August, I suspected Eliza of drunkenness the moment I laid eyes on her. Of course she did. For all her afflictions, and it was evident from the rags and tatters herself and the children were wearing, which a few stitches might have prevented, I fear these habits were acquired before she left England. I have proved her a liar in many instances and wondered at her apparent cheerfulness with all her maladies, and may she reform for her dear children's sake. By October 1836, it seems as though Eliza's behaviour has started to improve somewhat. James tells me his wife is altered in her conduct. He goes on a journey to Manchester tomorrow. I hope she may be reformed. She is a poor, afflicted thing. And I pity her. Is there such a cutting remark as I pity her? Despite all that is going on at home, Anne Floyd does her best to keep abreast of what is happening in the colony of Van Diemen's Land, perhaps impressing upon her daughter how invested she is in Mary's new life there. On October 28, 1836, Henry Edwards brought me some papers from Hobart Town. How happy the people are at Governor Arthur's removal. I do hope the new governor is good to you, she writes. Mm. Her joy at receiving word from Van Diemen's Land is evident and she takes pains to share any news with her extended family and Mary's acquaintances. Received a letter from dear Mary with her likeness in it. I am delighted. How glad Mr C would have been to see it. Miss Chapman called and she is delighted with Mary's likeness too. I have showed Mr Hayes Mary's likeness and he says he would rather see the original. I don't know who Mr Hayes is, but he's clearly got an eye for Mary. <laughs> on November the 11th, 1836, Mary goes to Aldridge to see the Allports, and of the visit she writes, My heart aches for Mr, Mrs and Miss Allport. I am sure Joseph has no idea of their being so put about. John, so their son John Allport, Joseph's brother, will not pay them any interest, and Henry, the other brother, will pay them nothing, saying he's wiped off his debts and their ingratitude is wearing the old people into their grave. The house they can either dispose of or let, and they remain in it in great misery. It would appear Mr and Mrs Allport are having just as much trouble with their offspring as Anne Floyd is having with hers. As we come to the end of 1836, things are starting to look more promising for the Chapmans. There is even a glimmer of hope that Thomas's business may begin to improve. Thomas has gone off at a minute's notice to London tonight. May better days come to him. Nothing but trouble for him, I fear. But as the fares arose, I think he will do better. Because that will work. Let's just lift the prices. Um, this was not to be, however, and on December the 1st, 1836, Anne Floyd writes the following. Marion, so Tom's wife, walked from Greek to see me. Poor thing. I am grieved of Tom's affairs, but I hope all will be well. My brother, James Ebbett, will lend Tom £150 and I have lent him £300 as things have turned out, unfortunately, for me. On December the 8th, lent Tom another £100 to enable the coaches to move on. On December the 9th, Tom is full of trouble. God only knows how it will end. The new year, 1837, does not bring much improvement with it. The coaches are at a standstill due to snow. Anne Floyd is plagued by strange dreams and daughter Louisa Mucklow suffers a miscarriage and is very ill. Anne Floyd herself takes ill but is obliged to take care of Louisa's young son, Charles Willie. On January the 13th, 1837, Louisa is still very weak. I am ill in mind and body. The baby's well, but I think he has forgot the breast. He is rather a trouble to us, as this is not a house for children or illness. To add to this, baby Charles Willie falls ill too, and with his mother still so unwell, Anne Floyd and God so are left to care for him once more. Leeches applied to his little chest do nothing, and while he does recover, Anne Floyd learns that all of the terrorists of Eliza, 
Jimmy and Annie, have also fallen ill. On the 19th of January, 1837, she writes, all are ill at the terrace. I trust the Almighty will either remove them or aid them. They are a great trouble to me. All sympathies for Anne Floyd, Anne, all sympathies Anne Floyd had for her poor afflicted daughter-in-law have now firmly evaporated in light of her alleged conduct and drunkenness. And it appears James has not escaped her vexation either. Sent God's so to the terrace, then they are all very ill. God's will be done is all I can say, and ease my burden, for nothing but trouble have I had since James's return. On February the 1st, 1837, I think James is deranged. He is going off to Liverpool, such a wife he has got, would derange any man. I have given James five pounds and he has gone to Liverpool. His wife shall go to her friends and I will take the children. Sent God so to the terrace and to pay various bills Eliza has run up. No management or care in her so that she can get drink, no matter by what means. It is terrible. Eliza, it would seem, has not reformed as Anne Floyd had so optimistically hoped that previous October. September the 7th, 1837, or sorry, February the 7th, 1837, went to call on Miss Chapman and we went together to Eliza's, whose heart is as callous as stone. Talking is of no avail, but I will sell up everything there and I had better pay for lodgings rather than pay for a servant and her wages. As for Thomas, well, on March the 6th, 1837, she writes, my unfortunate Thomas and James Brown, so his business partner, have lost 70 horses since Christmas. So this, this is March. <laughs> what will be the result makes me wretched. I told you we had unluck. Unfortunate Thomas, indeed, he does have the worst luck with horses, which is troublesome considering his profession as a coach proprietor. <laughs> for Anne Floyd, this is devastating, though. She is faced with having to sign on as a petitioning creditor for Tom's business in order to save her own property in Greet, where Thomas and his wife are living, to secure my own property, obliged me to be a petitioning creditor. I do not understand it. Very poorly indeed. Thomas came to dinner and he is very ill. I shall be glad when his fares are settled. My heart is torn on Paul William, so her other son William, and Charles, her son-in-law, on their, on, their, on their account, as Chapman and Brown owe them £100, and I am very unhappy. My inside is all a flutter with these shocks of my children's affairs. God give me strength to bear up. At the end of March 1837, Thomas and his partner, the Brown brothers, are, are gazetted as bankrupts. It makes my heart ache, writes Anne Floyd on the 26th of March, 1837. I trust I shall get over my great losses, what straits he has placed me in. On March 28th, 1837, went up to Richards and Mottram, so the solicitors, and before three of the commissioners signed my name as petitioning creditor on Chapman and Brown. It makes me very ill. I can only imagine how heartbreaking this must have been for Anne Floyd. The fortitude she shows as she carries on in such in the face of such adversity is to her credit. Forced to endure disappointment after disappointment brought on mainly by her adult children and their inability to succeed in life, she is faced with yet another heartbreak when she loses her dear sister-in-law, Miss Mary Morton Chapman, on April the 14th, 1837, after a short illness. Dear Miss Chapman departed this life at half past 11 at night. She went off like a lamb. She did not know she was gone. Sensible to the last, I have lost a kind a kind advisor and friend. Miss Chapman was buried on the 18th of April, 1837 with her parents, Thomas and Anne Morton Chapman at St Philip's Churchyard. Her few belongings were divided between Anne Floyd's children, including items sent to Mary in Van Diemen's land. On the 24th of April 1837, Anne Floyd's brother, James Everett, brings news that the coach business has been sold, but Thomas and the Browns are still forced to sell everything of value, including their remaining horses. One might argue that might be a good thing for the horses. Um, oh, it makes my heart ache. Poor Thomas, she writes on the 29th of April 1837. This is followed by the news that James and Eliza are also being forced to sell up. Went to Leamingham Terrace when they had an inventory, were to take an inventory for the sale. Oh, poor James, how changed are your prospects? As May 1837 draws to a close and we find Anne Floyd preparing to end another journal, we learn that Tom is forced to take a position as a coachman. 
He is nervous and poorly. He drives to Northampton and back 100 miles on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays. Louisa is then struck down by a mysterious illness causing numbness in her limbs. To Mary, Anne Floyd's right at the conclusion of this journal, God bless you, my dear child. Believe all the love and affection and good wishes you can imagine emanates from my heart for you and all my children. I do not tell you all my grief and anxieties, for why should I when months will pass before I hear from you and such a world of water separates us? May we all be more prosperous, and I trust that we shall. God bless you and your husband and children. The next journal will pick up in September 1837, but alas, as predicted, I have run out of time. However, as promised in my previous talk, I will leave you with Anne Floyd's thoughts upon seeing Queen Victoria while in Brighton during November and October, October November of 1837. So there we have the beautiful Queen. Right. She is very small and to me a singular countenance and I would say not a very wise one. I saw the Queen pass and repass four times in a shabby pink bonnet and a purple silk cloak. She is in an open barouche with the Countess of Mulgrave. The Queen is so mean in her dress that a lady said that when she appeared at church in a new blue bonnet, it created quite a sensation. The Queen passes us twice. She is certainly like Mary Evatt, so Anne Floyd's niece, but not so good looking. While in Brighton, Anne Floyd made friends with Mr Mordet, who was the Queen's confectioner. She has a habit of making friends with important people, which gave her entree into the areas of she would otherwise never have been able to set foot, namely the pavilion at Brighton, and avoided her more opportunity to observe the young queen. I walked around the queen's dinner table, touched her knife and fork. I saw all in the staterooms, and I cannot describe them. It equals all you will read in Arabian entertainments. Mr Mordet placed us behind a screen where we saw the queen the Duchess of Kent and 16 of the nobility take dinner with her. A little bit creepy. Um, the Queen sits in the centre of the table and I saw her take vegetables and eat them. She's a little, how do, a little bit creepy. She is a little interesting creature and she wears her hair straight over her forehead and had a white rose on her left ear and a black silk dress on, trimmed with a little black lace but no ornaments. The, force, the first course was removed while I stood there salmon, turbot, herring and various sorts of soup. We then went to Mr Mordet's apartments where we saw the beautiful confectionery and the Queen's desserts put out. Eight gold plateaus that cost £1,800 with branches filled with bonbons, cakes, etc. We remained for three hours. After they came back from the Queen's table, I took some of them in my bag. I shall divide them amongst my family. Some I will send to Mary's children. I forgot to say yesterday the Queen's passed our window four times. I curtsied, as did Kate Hayes, who she was visiting with, and she bowed to us and it made me share tears of pleasure. She smiled upon everyone and I could not help thinking what an arduous undertaking and responsible situation she had to feel. One could argue that Anne Floyd herself had arduous undertakings and great responsibilities of her own, on her own shoulders. While she may not have ruled an empire, she was most definitely a woman who, through choice or not, became the governor of her own realm, which, considering what we have learned about the Chapmans, was a formidable task indeed. So I'll leave you with a couple of pictures that are from our collection. Um, so you'll see there. It's French, so clearly I'm not going to say that because I managed to butcher the English language alone anywhere else. But these are actually from the author collection. So she writes in her journal, as you can see at the top, about when she went to have these photographs, these, these images taken. So that's the family there. So we have Uncle Tom. So it's, it's named, obviously, for the awful children. So it's Uncle Tom. And then we have nurse, the nurse Godsoes down there. We've got Louisa. We've got Mrs um, Chapman there. I think Louisa is on the other one. I think that's William up the other end. And then we have another one that's just a... Um, her sister Fanny and two of Fanny's girls. Okay, so I'm happy to answer questions or do you want me to just give you a quick rundown of what happens to the rest of the Chapman family? Do you want to know what happens to them? Yeah. Do you want to know what happens? Okay, super quick rundown. Okay, here we go. So Anne Floyd Chapman um, left the castle in after being essentially evicted by her brother, Mr James Evatt. Um, and the 1841 census shows that she is living with her nurse, Sarah Godzo. 
and her grandson Charles William Mucklow in Coventry Road in Aston in Warwickshire. Um, next door to her, her son William is living with his wife Emma. She dies in 1848 and she leaves a bequest to all her surviving children and grandchildren, including those here, um, Sarah Godso and other family members. So Fanny, there she is, moves to London in 1839 and her daughter Jane becomes Mrs Beck and some of you will recognise that name. And her other daughter, Sarah Plymy Edwards, both spend time with Mary Morton in Tasmania. So Jane marries Mr Beck and they move to South Australia um, where they have a family. And in Mary Morton's journals of 1852, three, I can't remember, um, she writes about the visit to the family that the family have made to her and it's with great joy and they're very excited about that. Later in Mary Morton's life, towards the end of her life, her niece, Sarah Plummy Edwards, comes to stay with her. And she unfortunately gets caught up in the whole Curzon thing when Mary Morton dies and it becomes a bit of a tragedy. So she heads back to England, um, where she lives with her sisters, who her other sisters who didn't marry, who didn't marry. Um, Fanny's son, John, gets himself in all sorts of trouble and he is arrested in 1860 for forgery. He absconds to the continent under an assumed name where he is recaptured and sentenced to seven years penal servitude, but he is instead placed in an asylum where he's released three years later. Mm. Daughter Georgiana marries Mr Astley and her estate is handled by Cecil Allport, which is all a bit strange considering she never actually comes here. She stays there, but Cecil handles her affairs. Who knows why? Um, Fanny dies in 1858. Thomas and Marion both die in 1843. I don't have any more information on them, but I imagine that their, you know, their life has not been great given Thomas's troubles. Um, Humphrey, Captain Humphrey, Jewett's a lady he's been courting, much to the disgust of his mother, who writes about it, if you imagine. Um, he then marries a young lady in Oporto, Portugal. Her name is Margaret Augusta Smythe. Again, it's written about in the journals. And he dies after falling overboard off the Irish coast on the way home to Liverpool in 1843. Yes, Charles Everett Chapman died in Texas in the USA in 1848. Hooray. Yeah, it's a sight sister. <laughs> Eliza, not sure what happens to her, but last we hear she's living in Liverpool. Her children do go on to have very happy lives, don't worry. They're, they're happy. They're not necessarily with their mother a lot of the time, but they are. So William and Emma, they move to Wales, where William becomes a landowner and a justice of the peace. He and Emma retire to Gloucestershire, and he dies in 1884. Mary Morton Orport, we know what happens with her. Um, I love the fact that Mary Morton writes journals for Morton, her son, who, comes, who goes travelling to England to see the family, just as her mother had written for her. I love that. Um, Louisa is left a widow when her first husband, Charles Mucklow, dies after a long illness in 1838. She then marries again to a Charles James Hartley, who is the executor of her late husband's will and makes quite a few appearances in the journal. Um, they get married in 1841 and she has nine more children and she dies in 1863. There you go. Thank you very much. Anyone got any questions? <laughs> Anyone want to go back to the 1830s, be part of the Chapman family, <laughs> okay. enjoy life? Yeah. High Street Burning. Yeah. I remember it. Um, to go to the castle? Must have been in Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Basically, it must have been filthy dirty. It would have been. It must yep. have been um, sort of, you know. Anyway, I yep. can now understand why some of the people in Birmingham were like they were. Yeah. So if you if you um, read the journal, so you can read the journals, and obviously I've cut out huge amounts um, mm -hmm. in the journals, but she. Ooh, um, she she writes about that. So she, you know, they they travel through mud and they've got stables out the back and they're dealing with you know people dropping dead out the front of the house. They've got drunks falling left, right, and centre all over the place. It's all a bit. Plus she's got her family. Plus she's doing battle with her brother who has taken over ownership of it after their father's death and he's trying to get his little hands in. So now instead of her running it as she wanted to, as she had done for the last 20 years with her husband, 
she's now beholden to her brother and he's not making life easier for her and he's putting up rents on the place. So she's, you know, it, it's an absolute nightmare how she survived as long as she did. She's only in her 50s too, as we write this. She's only in her late 50s. So she's, you know, it's a tough life. Yeah, yeah, it was, but, you know. I've been to different fiction. Oh. I mean, the diary's <laughs> very more than awful. Mm, yep. Everybody's in the family is sick. Everybody's sick. The husband's sick. Uh, Mary, their eldest daughter is Minnie. Sick. Minnie gets sick a lot. Minnie, I think, had rheumatic fever as a child. And that was in Hobart. That was in Hobart, yeah. So Fanny Edwards, her kids sick. One of them had smallpox. One of them has issues with her leg and they go to the sea quite often yeah. because sea water was apparently helping with her, her rehabilitation, so to speak. Yeah, it's all a bit, you know, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. Anyone else got any questions? No, you all, you all look a bit stunned. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not being this stunned. Wasn't that bad, was it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's congratulate me, mate. Oh, thanks, chocolate. That's why I do it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Kate, and thank you to everyone for attending. Um, we do have another family history talk tomorrow, and it's with the National Archives of Australia yeah. upstairs in our... Um, you might know it as our microspace. It's now our treasures gallery. So that will be at 2 a.m. 2 p.m. 2 a.m. So we'll <laughs> That'll be fun. <laughs> uh, so we'll look forward to seeing you then. Um, if anyone wants to leave some feedback, we've got some feedback forms and some nice family feedback. history charts. And if you'd like to leave some great feedback for Kate, yeah. we'd really appreciate it. Nice. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, thank for you. coming. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much.